Uh, thanks everyone for coming today. Every, how's the volume on the mic? Is it fine? Good? Okay. Cool. So, I guess before we really start, a few housekeeping things. So, homework five uh, was released on Monday. Uh, so, that's on Lambda Calculus. And homework six, which is the makeup homework, was released yesterday. Uh, so, any have any questions on how the makeup homework works? I feel like it's pretty clear, but. There's always room for questions. Is that a hand or no? No, no hand? Okay. So homework six. Yes. You said in your message on the, on the thread, it's not required. Correct. It is optional. It's a makeup homework. So whatever you get on that homework assignment, when we multiply by 70, that will be your final score. If that's greater than, it will replace your lowest score if it's greater than it, right? So. It only helps you, but if you, the max you can get is 70, so it's just like the homework submission, uh, the uh, project three and project four resubmission. Yeah. Yeah, they should be posted. I think Mosin posted it last night. He sent out an email on the mailing list. You know that mailing list? You've been paying attention to all year. If you have an exclamation mark, uh, you should wait for project four. Homework four is being graded this week, so by Friday, homework four should be graded in the end. It may even be sooner than that, but definitely by Friday. Okay, I thought you were asking about project four. I was like, yeah, that's, that's not great. Okay, so where we're at right now, right? We're almost to the end of Lambda Calculus. So we looked at addition, and then we saw uh, on Monday that, hey, we can actually define uh, we can use addition to actually define multiplication, right? So we can define a multiplication function, and we want its signature to take in two numbers, quote, quote. I'm using numbers because it's really functions that are representing numbers. And we want it to take in two numbers and return and beta reduce to the result of multiplying those two numbers together. So we want something that does takes in multiplies 0 and 1 and returns 0, right? Because 0 times 1 is Zero, yay, everybody's alive. Okay, uh, multiplying one and two is two, and multiplying two and five is 10. These are the things that we want from our multiplication operator. And so it turns out it's actually really simple. So uh, simple, quote, quote, in that it's not super complicated, but maybe not simple in an easy to understand sense. But we think about it, okay. So what this is defining, so we know that it's, um, this is a lambda expression that's defining an abstraction that has an inner abstraction. So we can think of this occurring, right, is this is a function that takes in two parameters, n and m, and then calls m and applies it to the function add n to zero. So what is, so these are numbers, right? So what was the, how do we actually define these numbers? What would the body of the number two look like? Yeah. Like F, F, X. F, F, X, yeah. So whatever the first parameter is, we're going to apply that that many times to the second parameter. So here in the body of the multiplication, if this M is a numeral, what's the first parameter here? If this is a number, what's the first parameter to this number? the add n, right, that whole thing. And so what's going to happen is that is going to be applied that many times to 0. So we have m times add n to 0 and add those, those all of those results. So that's multiplication, right? So take the second number and add n plus n plus n that many times, however many times the second number is. That's all this in code, right? So it actually is Fairly simple, I don't know, I mean, we don't all program in Lambda Calculus all day, right? So it's not like you just say, aha, I've discovered multiplication, I'll write it down exactly like this, right? Uh, it's a big trial and error process. Um, the question? No. Okay, so then let's see how this actually works. So multiplying zero and one, right? So let's expand out the multiplication definition. So we just use this definition that we have. Uh, lambda n, lambda, uh, lambda m, m add n 0 applied to 0 and 1. Right. 
So now I want to do the first application. So what's going to happen here? What am I going to apply? Yeah. Yeah, zero to n, right? So I'm going to, in the body of this abstraction, I'm going to replace n with zero. So anytime every free n I see in here, I'm going to replace it with a zero. So do I have to worry about any free variables in this zero that I'm doing this replacement? No, why not? So but zero is a function, right? It's defined as a function. So it's not zero. Zero is not the numeral we know. It is the function that we defined previously in those slides. So why don't I need to worry about a free variable in there? Or I have to worry about renaming because of something in there. There are no free variables, right? The way we define 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, all of those, they're all combinators. So they have no free variables. Therefore, we don't need to worry about doing any of that substitution and changing anything. So we can just replace the n with a 0, right? Just like a function call. Combinator. Got it. Now everybody remembers. <laughs> all right, now we do the next application. So which meta variable are we going to replace? M with what? One. One. Yes. So now we replace that. Great. So now, um, so one, we know the definition of one. So one is a function that takes in two parameters, f and x, and it applies f to x, right? So we can apply that, right? So this is in, this is a beta reducible expression because on the left hand side we have something with a lambda and we have application here. Uh, so we can easily do this. If we walk through those steps, we can replace it, and we get add 0 and 0. What's the result of adding 0 and 0? 0. Yes. Very good. Awesome. So this is good, right? This is exactly what we wanted. Now let's look at something slightly more complicated, right? We want to multiply 1 and 2. So we do the same thing here. We're going to uh, expand out, multiply, and then we're going to substitute in n for 1 in the body there. And then we're going to substitute 2 for n. So we get 2, add 1, and 0. So this 2, what's this going to do? What's, this, what's the result of this going to be? Add 1, add 1, 0. Exactly. Right? Because that's how we define the numeral 2 as a function. So it's going to transform this to this. Right? So this right-hand side is the equivalent of add 1 and 0. What's the result of adding 1 and 0? 1. And this is the same thing as this, right? So what's adding 1 plus 1? 2. Two. We've got multiplication. <laughs> Super awesome, right? Any questions on this? So you can see we've skipped a lot of steps here. But if you completely you know, expand all of these out to all of their definitions, it'll work just fine. OK, so are we Turing complete now? So what have we had so far? What kind of operations have we defined on lambda calculus? What was it? Addition. Addition, Addition multiplication. Uh, we didn't get into it, but you can define subtraction. Boolean. Boolean. So we defined Booleans themselves, and we also defined Boolean logic operators. Also branching statements, right? So we define how to do an if statement. We have Boolean logic, true-false branches, we have arithmetic. But what do we mean by turn completeness? What does that mean at a high level? You don't have to give like a precise definition. Yeah. Or I guess anything code could do with lambda calculus. Hmm. Can I say that a little bit louder? Uh, basically, we can do anything that like a typical computer could do or basic Anything that a typical computer could do. Close. There's a special type of computer that we're talking about here. What was that? Yeah, the Turing machine, right? It's in the name. So Turing complete, right? It means that uh, a Turing machine means that any program in your language that you can write in that language, you can execute on a Turing machine. You could make a Turing machine that could do that. Yeah. Can I defend my classmate? Yeah, absolutely. By the church Turing thesis, what anything a computer could do, a Turing machine could do, so it's the same thing. 
true, but the definition is more focused. I was going to go through the back end. Yes, it is. Uh, it's similar because uh, pretty much every language that you're programming in is Turing complete, although some languages are not. Uh, you wouldn't really think of them as programming languages per se, uh, but something like JSON, right, which is a data standard format, it's not really Turing complete. Okay, so yeah, so code. But it's what we think of code, and the reason why we think of it as code is because it is Turing complete. Yes. Okay. So what are we missing? What can can you write a function that you could write in a normal program that you can't write in Lambda Calculus so far? Yes. Yeah, we need some way to loop, right? We have no way to either recurse or do a loop. Right? So far, we've seen we can branch, right? We can calculate, do some arithmetic. We haven't really seen any way of how to loop, right? So let's say we want to implement uh, the factorial function. So what is the factorial function? So n factorial. What's this defined as? What's the base case? Yes. What is one? Factorial of 0 equals 1, right? So, got to establish the base case. The base case is if n is 0, then factorial of 0 is 1. And exactly. So, the factorial of any number n is n times factorial of n minus 1. Right? So, in effect, for any n, it's n times n minus 1 times n minus 2 times n minus 3 times n minus 4, all the way up to you get to where n is 0, where that is 1. And then you multiply all those together and you have the factorial. Can you write this in C? Yes? Probably something you did, hopefully, in like your first couple years of programming. All right, so then write it. So what's the first thing I do in my factorial function? If n equals 0, what? Just return 1. Boom, return 1. And then what? And then you say return uh, n times fact of n minus 1. Yeah, return n times factorial of n minus 1, right? So here we have this very simple recursive definition where we want to say, hey, call this function again, right, to compute a result, and then call this function again, and call this function again. Let's write this in lambda calculus. So we're going to first assume that we have functions called is0 and predicate, or sorry, predecessor, not predicate, for that. So what does is0 do? Let's make up semantics. That makes sense. Return 0. I remember. No. Somebody else. What was it? Return true of zero. Yeah, return true of zero, false otherwise. Yeah. Exactly. So it's a function, it takes in a nu numeric, if you're thinking types, right, it takes in one numeric value and it returns true if that numeric value is zero, otherwise it returns false. And we can write that with the lambda calculus we already have. I didn't go into it because I don't want to get into it. Okay. So predecessor is the opposite of successor. So, so what was the type of successor? What were the semantics of su the successor function? Yeah. So it takes in the number and then returns the next number. Yeah, it takes in the number and returns the next number. So it takes an n and it returns n plus 1. So what would the predecessor function do? Yeah, it takes an n and returns n minus 1. Okay, just so we're clear, these are well defined and you can actually define these things. So let's write our function. This should be super simple, right? Okay, so we want to define a function fact, fact, factorial, factorial function. And it's a function that takes in one parameter, n, right, which makes sense. And then we have our if, which we've defined. And then we say is 0, is n 0. So if it is 0, then we get to the true, which is the second parameter to the if statement, which returns 1, right? Otherwise, if n is not 0, then the second thing is going to be executed, which multiplies n times factorial of the predecessor of n. Right? And that's a little inside out of the way you're used to normally thinking about this, but if you break this down and look at it as we were thinking about lambda calculus, right, this makes sense. So is this good? Are we done? Go home. What's the problem with this function? Is there a problem with it? Yeah. We have a defined naming or type of semantics. 
Yeah, well, we haven't defined naming or assignment semantics, right? So what have we kind of used before? So what about, so we're using is zero here, or like molt, right? So how is that different than this fact that we have here? Yeah, so remember, we, def we defined molt as a function, and we gave the exact definition, right? And so we could fully expand that definition. We're saying, hey, molt is just a placeholder for this. You could take that thing and plug it in there anywhere you see molt, right? which makes sense. That's, it's more of a definition in a mathematical sense. We're saying defining molt as this thing, right? So we can do that. We can do that with this is zero function that we didn't actually write, but that is usually exists. With this if, if is just lambda, F, lambda a dot a, I think is all if is, right? And predecessor as well. What about fact? What do we replace here for fact? That entire, that entire thing. What does that entire thing mean, contain? All right, if we want to replace this, this would, we have to replace this whole thing and this whole thing would have fact in it. We can replace that whole thing that would have fact in it and that whole thing that would have fact in it. Right? So you have this terrible, terrible. So you, you can't actually define this in the lambda calculus that we've been talking about, right? So you just can't write this function. We can't use the function itself in its definition. Because the way we've been doing things, we just can't do that. So do we give up? Go home? Oh. Okay, no, this is where other people invented, um, I think it was Alonzo uh, Church was the one who came up with this uh, combinator. Uh, it's called the Y Combinator, it looks super weird, but uh, it looks like this. So it itself is an application, and on the left-hand side, and it's the same thing on the left-hand side and the right-hand side, so to prevent you from kind of looking at both too hard. So we have lambda x, lambda y, so this takes in two parameters, and it takes the second parameter and calls it on x, x, y in the second parameter. And then we have another application that does the exact same thing. Seems strange. Yes. So let's look at this why food. Right? Let's apply this to food. So here, we're going to expand out the Y Combinator. We're going to have the Y Combinator here, and we're going to apply it to food. Right? So do we have an application that we can make here? What can we apply? Is anything a beta redux? Can we reduce anything? Yeah. Can we apply foo to the uh, second section to the exon? Uh, no. Because of the way the parentheses are, right? So we have the y is in its own parentheses. So here we have a big application, and inside there is an application. It's not a lambda abstraction, right? So the only thing we could do is apply this thing to itself in the inside. OK, so then we apply it. So we basically, so you can see each of these is itself a combinator, right? There's no free variables in each of those applications. So it's very simple. I can take the right-hand side, and I can replace every x on the left-hand side with the right-hand side. Right. Just a beta reduction, just mechanical. So I have lambda y dot y, and then I have the left thing, the right thing, and then y. Now can I beta reduce with foo? Yeah, because it's in the form the left side is a lambda function, right, is an abstraction, and the right it's, and it's a lambda function applied to something, which is an expression. So now I can take foo and plug foo in here for y. So it's going to be foo and then this thing. And remember, I'm not going to replace this y because this is guarded here, right? This y refers to this y. And I'm not going to replace this y because this y refers to this y. I'm going to replace this y because this y refers to here and this y refers to here. So I just place foo here. 
Oh, sorry, but I do replace this y. Yes. I replace this y because this y is bound to this meta variable here. Uh, you got to make sure the parentheses match. Yes. Okay, good. So that this abstraction is bound, this abstraction x, y is only bound here. So this y is bound to this y here. Okay. So what is this thing here in the middle? What do you mean what we started with? Ah. Yeah, what what that we started with? Yeah, it's y foo. Right? So we apply it once, and now we have foo applied to the same thing. So what happens if we expand out this middle thing? We just did this, right? We're going to expand y foo, and it's going to give us foo applied to y foo, and we're going to expand this y foo, and it's foo applied to y foo, and we can keep going out and out and out infinitely forever. This one here? Uh, in here. This foo replaces this y at the front here oh, and the y at the back. Exactly. So yeah, that's why there's a second foo here. So you can see it's basically in this form kind of where we have y is that function and then x, x, these x's are the new y combinator and the y is the function again from the definition. That's kind of how we get that. So this will go out to infinity. So it turns out you can uh, create you can uh, create recursion from this. So this is kind of crazy, but it's super awesome. Okay, this is a function we want to define, right? We want to define factorial is this thing because that's what makes sense. The problem is we can't actually define this factorial function, right, with itself. So what we're going to do is we're going to abstract out that function f, that factorial function, and we're going to enclose this thing in a new abstraction and abstract over that function f. So that function f that we call is not yet defined. It's a uh, parameter to this abstraction. And then we're going to close that whole thing with the y combinator. So let's run through an example. Let's see what happens. Okay, we do factorial one, and this is actually incredibly complicated. So I'm going to go through one example. Um, okay, so we just substitute in one here. So we have the y combinator, and then we have the definition of our function that we want factorial, and then we have the parameter one. Right. So I'm going to apply the left. I'm going to do a beta reduction on the leftmost side first. So here. Oh, actually, first I'm going to expand. Okay, yes. So we're actually not going to go through the steps of expanding the y combinator because that is crazy. So what we're going to do is we're going to use what we've learned before. If we have y foo, that's going to beta reduce to foo y foo, right? So here foo is just this this thing, right? So we just treat it symbolically. We take that and replace it. So we say, okay, well that same thing again applied to y, that same thing, 1. OK, now we need to do our first beta reduction. So what can I beta reduce here? Ah. Yeah, this whole thing, y lambda f, right? This whole thing on the right here is being applied to this lambda f lambda n. So I can actually just take this whole thing and replace f in the left-hand side with that whole thing, right? And this thing, remember, is the thing I originally had, right? It's y, y our function. So I'm going to replace f with that. And so you see this f here, which is where we wanted the factorial, gets now our y combinator applied to that function that we just had. So we're going to do that step. 
and we replace this f with the y combinator. So now we have a big long thing that we can actually, and we got rid of the f, so now we can actually apply this to 1, which is what we originally had. So we apply this to 1, we substitute everywhere this n is bound here, we're going to substitute in 1. So that's, oops, uh, that's this n here in the is size 0 check, which makes sense. And it's this n and this multiply here. But notice it's not going to touch the n in here because this n is bound to a different abstraction, right? So let's do that. We replace that. So now we have if is 0, 1, return 1. Otherwise, multiply 1 by that same thing with the predicate of 1. I forgot about this n here at the end, right? With the predicate of 1. Cool. So now I can, I can evaluate whichever one I want now. So let's say, uh, let's do is 0, 1. What's that going to return? False. Exactly, false. So then I have if false one this whole thing. What's that going to return? The what? The second thing, yeah. So it's going to return this. So it's going to return multiply one by this whole thing applied to the predicate of one. So what is this guy? Predicate of one is zero. We're going to get to it later because I forgot about it. But while I was doing these steps. Um, but it's the point that it doesn't matter what way you reduce them. But right, let's we can reduce the uh, the middle here, and we've already done this. We can expand that out, and now we have uh, f of n if size zero n one multiply n by f predicate of n, and then the same thing, right? Y of foo. So we have y combinator applied to foo again with the predicate of one. Now we can apply that f in the function, just like we did before. So that f is now this y applied to foo. Then we do the predicate of 1, because this is definitely where it makes sense to do that. Now we can apply this 0 to this n, right? We can substitute in this n. We substitute the n for 0. And we have multiply 1 by if is 0, 0, 1. Otherwise, do this other thing. And so what's is 0, 0 going to return? True. And so what's this going to return? The if. 1. Multiply 1 by 1. What is that? 1. Yay, we just calculated the factorial of 1 in a super crazy way. You want to do it again? Factorial of 10? All the way down? No. Uh, we will not. But it goes to show you that you get this recursion from this y combinator. So we basically parameterize the function that we wanted to call, recursively call. And this y combinator allows us to call a function essentially with itself. So we can actually do recursion without having any named variables or any named functions, right? which is pretty cool. So we have, we've now defined, a, I'm definitely not going to go into proof. We defined a Turing complete language here using only functions and only function application. Those are it, the only two things. Right? We've defined Boolean logic, we defined arithmetic, we define multiplication, and then we define basically loops, right? Because recursion is equivalent to a loop. Is that insane? Yes. Yes, yes it's insane. It's crazy. That's why I love this guy. Uh, okay, any questions? Why would anyone want to use this? <laughs> no artifacts. What do you mean no artifacts? They're like, you don't have like little variables that will change, so anything that you do automatically will know that it's the right thing. Yeah, so one of the things, right, I mean, you got to think about compared to Turing machines, right? So, the, you know, you're not going to program in this, just like you're not going to program in a Turing machine. But the question kind of is, what's the most simplest form of computation, right? And to me, this, I mean, there's no variables, there's no infinite tape. There's no this machine that can move left or right. All this is function application. And yet, it's just as expressive as Turing machine. And it's just as expressive as your C program or your Perl program or your Python code. Yeah? Since logic is infallible, if we there uh, <laughs> Right, keep going. Uh, I, keep going. Uh, well, I mean, the rest depends on that. <laughs> okay, keep going. I want to see where you're going. I don't know if I agree with that statement. No premise, but. 
Would Y combinators be, Y combinators must exist if recursion exists? Uh, okay, so if I, if I tell you that they're, that, um, wait, say that again? So you couldn't have a universe in which you have something that's recursive without Y combinator and logic, or a Y combinator and logic without, I mean, they are necessarily the same thing. The short answer is probably I don't know. Okay. Uh, the longer guess is you have to have that. So it's one of those things that's like a chicken and egg thing, right? It's like if I tell you that this is a Turing complete language, then you must have some way to loop or recurse, right? So if I tell you that, it's up to you to find it. But this isn't how these things started, right? So they started with Turing creating his Turing machines and um, Church and all these other people developing lambda calculus. And then at some point, they were fighting over, well, what's the actual true way to, what does it mean to compute something, right? Is it something that's computable on a Turing machine, or is it something that's computable with lambda calculus? And then they kind of proved that they're actually equivalent. So they probably used these properties to prove equivalence, is my guess. So it's more like it, it came in that direction, right? Like if you have a language that you can do logic, arithmetic, and unbounded loops. So they popped up in different areas and then just happened yeah. to be. Yeah, that's crazy, right? Yeah. Yeah. Are you basically assuming that uh, division would be the same as multiplication in the way it's defined? My intuition is similar but harder. It's probably how it works. Oh, heck yeah. Yeah. I, if you work hard enough at it, I'm sure you could find division here. Yeah. Yeah, everything. You could do back four, I mean, uh, fractions. You could do exponentiation. Do derivatives, maybe. I don't know. I may be getting out of my depth. Overclaiming things. Any other questions on this stuff? OK. So that kind of actually wraps up the class here, which is Super weird to say. It's been a short but fun 15 weeks. Um, so I kind of want to go back a little bit because I've been thinking a lot about this class. And hopefully, you're not sitting there going, like, man, I've wasted 15 weeks learning about junk that I'm going to forget about for the rest of my career. Um, <laughs> oh, no. Nervous giggles because we had those thoughts. Um, <laughs> no, the more I think about it, more and more. OK, your problem, so leveling with you, yes, you're probably not going to be writing a compiler like a legit, taken in brand new programming language that you created and spit out x86 code. Um, it's possible, so I hope part of the reason why you should take this class and the thing you should take away is that it's possible, right? You can do it. You can write your own crazy programming language and write a compiler for it. You've written, I don't even know how many parsers now, right? You're pretty good at parsing, I hope. Um, you understand how to loop over the data structures and how to create intermediate representation, right? These are not things that only programming gods do, right? This is basic bread and butter computer science stuff. So that shouldn't ever deter you in the future. Uh, the other thing is these things come up all the time in places where we do not call them compilers. So if you're ever parsing something, parsing some input, right, you're essentially building a tiny little compiler using stuff you learned in this class. Like, what does a web browser do? Yes, it takes bytes from a server and parses those bytes into HTML into a graphical representation to display to you, the user. It is legit, even just not thinking about JavaScript or anything, it is still a compiler. It's taking random raw bytes and trying to make sense of it. And that's using the stuff that we learned in this class. Uh, those cases exist all the time. Even you know, data formats, right? Reading a JPEG image, reading in all these kinds of stuff. You're essentially parsing something. So I would find it highly unlikely that you go your entire career without ever having to parse some weird data format. So hopefully you realize, well, maybe these are kind of useful. Or hopefully the projects help you become a better programmer. That's also a sub goal of this class. Uh, cool. OK, with that, we'll go to midterms. So thank you. All right. First thing that everyone wants to know, midterm stats. So the median was an 84. Uh, the average was an 81. The standard deviation was 13. Uh, the min was 41, and the max is 100. Questions on this? 
All right, you want to walk through the midterm? Oh, yeah, in the back. Yes. Um, so I noticed on, for the two midterms, it says 25% of the overall yes. rate. Does that mean they're both equivalent? Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay, we have a midterm. Okay, this is for version one. Um, so we'll go over this. Uh, you should be able to figure it out based on your paper. So if you're not version one, it should be very clear. Okay. Global variables are allocated on the stack. Oh, and when I say we go over it, I mean, I'm not going to just tell you the answers. You have to tell me the answers. So global False. variables are allocated on the stack. False. False. Where are global variables allocated? <laughs> it doesn't matter. Not on the stack. <laughs> okay. Good. Uh, in the CDECL calling convention, the callee creates space on the stack for local variables. True, right? But, and it makes sense, right? You actually don't want the caller to create the space because the caller is just calling some functions. It shouldn't have to care how much, how much space it needs for local variables, right? Okay. In the CDECL calling convention, the callee pushes the arguments onto the stack. False. Right? By the same reasoning, how are you, you're the function that got called. How are you supposed to push variables onto the stack, uh, your, your parameters onto the stack, right? The arguments come from the person who calls you, so they definitely should be pushing things onto the stack. Uh, you can ask questions if you have questions on these, by the way. Raise your hands. No normal class stuff. Okay. On the x86 architecture, all memory addresses on the stack below the stack pointer are garbage. True? Depends on which way you look. Not really. Below, I think, has a very specific meaning. Is it true or false? True. True? Why, somebody said false. Why false? Yeah. Because the heap is underneath. Because the heap is underneath. So this is a poorly worded question. And one of your uh, fellow students alerted me to that fact on the writing. So you can thank them. Uh, so yeah, I said either true or false on this question. So. Um, it was poorly worded. It was intended to be true. So the intent was to be true, but I realized I was too specific by specifying x86, and because the heap is below the, the stack, then it is also false as well. So the intent was true, but I accepted both. But it says on the stack. The heap is not the stack. No, it says all, me uh, but it also says all memory addresses. So also below the stack, it doesn't make sense. There, the, the stack is only defined as from the top to the current bottom to ESP, right? So below it also doesn't make sense either. So it's poorly worded in two ways. Thanks for pointing that out. All right, heap allocation is automatically deallocated in C. False. Yes. Right. Heap allocation. If you call new, you have to call free. X is equal to Y in sharing semantics means to bind the name X to the location associated with Y. True, right? So here, this is definitions of sharing semantics. Okay. Anonymous types do not have a name. Exactly, they are anonymous. They do not have a name. The compiler may give them an internal name, but they do not have a name. Yeah. But it's not, that's not its name. It's an internal name that's only relevant to a compiler. But we don't have that, the definition of name anymore. To know whether it was internal or external, it just said name. Ah, no. <laughs> I made that very clear when we went over the, over the practice midterm. Right? Anonymous types do not have names. That's why they're not name equivalent. A dangling reference is memory that has been allocated on the heap has not been explicitly deallocated, yet is inaccessible by the program. False. What is it? What was it? Garbage. Yeah, garbage memory is memory that's been allocated on the heap, has not been explicitly deallocated, and is inaccessible by the program. What is a dangling reference? A dangling reference is when you have a reference to memory that has been freed already. So here the big difference is. Um, 
Right, exactly. Yeah. So if you, yeah. it'd be like returning, uh, yeah, if you freed a variable and you still have a reference to that memory, that's mem that is now a dangling reference because the area that that memory points to is free, um, has been explicitly deallocated. All right. Programmers define new types of type constructors. Yes, you have to do that, right? Type constructors. Okay. Uh, in Linux libc, malloc allocates new heap memory for the program by itself. False. What does it call? Something with an S, which is why I restarted this. Yeah, S break. S break. It calls S break. Okay, question on these? You didn't specify which libc. There are many libc that can be used with Linux. Mm, no, good try. It was pretty good. I agree, but it's clear from the context of the class. <laughs> Explicitly, because we covered that for two days. So, okay. All right. Problem two. Uh, this function. Uh, A B C D. If C D, then three plus four, three point one four, plus D array access A ten D else bc function call d0. Okay, so one thing that came up during the exam, there should be no ambiguity over what this means, right? Because you have the syntax tree, right? So some, if you're curious about what this meant, all you have to look is here and say, oh, it's a function call where the left-hand side is the result of calling b, giving it the parameter c, and then calling that with the result of d array access 0. Yes? Uh, no. I, huh? Yeah, you have to do it on homework six because I didn't want to draw it, but I'll guess I'll do it for the final. Yes. The final is basically like units. Is like Wait, what, what, what? Yeah. Maybe like an event coverage or everything's done, or are you going to focus more like. <laughs> Anything. Anything. Any distribution that I feel like is appropriate. Thank you. I don't know. It could be anything. Anything is fair game. Oh no, we have to remember first and follow set again. Okay. So, okay. First thing, fill in the blank, reduce the oh, important thing. Reducing all types to basic types and type constructors <laughs> is possible. Right? So no type A, type B, type C, type D, right? Those should all be reduced out. Okay, A, B, C, D, and the type that F returns. Okay, so we can go through this quickly. Um, an easy thing, so we know, okay, an if branch means that, so whatever the if branch returns is what f returns, right? So we know that the plus branch and this branch have to return the same thing, and so we know that this thing is 3.4 plus something, so this is a real, this returns a real, the addition of two reals returns a real. Uh, if this branch returns a real, that means this branch also has to return a real, which means f has to return a real. Okay. Questions? Okay. So this is actually going to be too difficult for me to just talk about, so let's go to the key. To the key. Okay. So A is a function that takes in two parameters, one an int, one an array of reals, and returns an int. So if we look at A, we can see A here is a function. It takes in two ints, so uh, no, it takes in an int and d, uh, the, what's this? d, which is an array of reals, and returns an integer. Which makes sense, right? It has to return an integer because it's being used in the array access operation. So it's got to be an integer. Okay. This one was cool. b was cool. So b is a function, if you look here, right? It's a function that takes in something of type c, and whatever it returns, it has to be a function. Right? And we know it has to be a function because it's being used on the left-hand side of a call operation. So just like lambda calculus says functions that return functions, right? This is exactly what this is. It's a function that takes in, what was C? Uh, it takes in an array of reals and it returns, oh no, it's a function that takes in an array of reals and returns a boolean, and it returns a function that takes in a real and returns a real. So this is a function that takes in a real and returns a real. Yes, because D is an array of reals. And C is a function that takes in an array of reals and returns a boolean. That's all. Right, 
C, array of reals boolean, D, array of reals, F returns real. So I, I don't know why, I try to make this easier by not putting the type of F, right, just the type that F returns, and yet some people still put F type here. So you're going to lose a ton of points, but reading is important. Okay, any questions on here? So these, it doesn't matter how complicated these things are, functions returning functions returning functions, right? You just apply the same rules over and over, right? And that's the way it goes. Questions on this? Oh, research graphs. Okay. Problem three. For each of the following types, list all the types that are structurally equivalent. Okay. So the first one is A. A is a string. Is anything else a string here? No. So, and remember, we said list all the types, so you should definitely list A itself. Right? So A is structurally equivalent to A. Okay. E. E is a structure containing one field foo, which is a string, the next field bar, which is an int. Is so it's definitely not structurally equivalent to anything before. Um, it's not structurally equivalent to this, because this is a pointer, this is a pointer, this is a pointer and a function, a pointer and a function. So all of these, it can't be structurally equivalent. The only thing it could possibly be equivalent to is f. So is it structurally equivalent to f? Why not? Order, yes, because the order is important on structural equivalents, right? Not the name. OK. G. G is a pointer to H and a C, where C is a pointer to A, where A is a string. So C is a pointer to a string. So we know this first one is a pointer. Uh, this is a pointer, but this is a function, so we know it's definitely not equivalent to G and I. Uh, we look at G and we say, okay, it's definitely not equivalent to J because this is a function, and we know that C is a pointer to a string. So it's not equivalent there, it's not equivalent to anything else. The only thing you're possibly equivalent to is H, right? So we assume that they're equivalent at first, right? And then we check, okay, is C equivalent to a pointer to a string? Yes. C is a pointer to an A, A is a string. So C is a pointer to a string, which is structurally equivalent to a pointer to a string. All right, so that's one. The other thing is pointer to H. So X is a type D. D is type pointer to H. Is pointer to H structurally equivalent to a pointer to H? Yes. So G and H are structurally equivalent. All right. Now I. So we already kind of showed I is not equivalent to anything else. The only thing it could possibly be equivalent to is J. So the first field is a pointer to J, and the first field is a pointer to I. Are these structurally equivalent? Yes. Yes, because we assume that I and J are structurally equivalent first. Then we have to look at the next field, right? So there are two functions. Do these functions have the same number of parameters? Yes. Do they have the same return type? Yes. Yes. Now we check if their parameters are structurally equivalent. Is J structurally equivalent to I? Yes, we're assuming it is. Is B structurally equivalent to a pointer to an int? Let's look at B. Sorry. B is a pointer to an int. Yes. So I is structurally equivalent to J. Any questions on those? No. All right. OK. Here we have fun times. A bunch of definitions. W, X are strings. Y is an A. Z is a C. P and Q are arrays of I's. R is an array of I. S is a function that takes in an I and returns an int. T is a function, or T is an I. So for each of the following statements, indicate if it's valid under name equivalence for one, structural equivalence for two, internal name equivalence for three, otherwise write four, write everything that applies. So P is equal to Q. Is that name equivalent? No, why not? They're not in this type, so they don't have a name. Exactly. OK, are they internal name equivalent? Yes, because they're defined in the same line by the compiler. Uh, so the compiler will give them the same internal name. Uh, are they, sorry, structure, are they structurally equivalent? Yes. Yes. Okay, so it should be 2, 3. Uh, Z, how are we doing on time? How are we doing pretty good? Z is equal to Q0. So Q is what? 
Array of i, what's q0 going to return? An i. And what is z? z is a c, which is a pointer to a string, and i is this structure. OK, so is that name equivalent? C and i are definitely not the same name, so that's what we can go off. Is it structurally equivalent? No. And is it internal name equivalent? No. Nope. So we're right for All right. X and Y. OK. X and Y. So, is, so X is of type string, Y is type A. Is it valid under name equivalence? No. No, because they do not have the same name. Is it valid under structural equivalence? Yes. Yes, because yes, they're the same structurally. Is it valid under internal name equivalence? No, because one's a C and one's a string. All right, WX, ah, WX uh, is name equivalent, structurally equivalent, and internal name equivalent, right? They're both strings. Q and R. Q and R, array of I, array of I. So is it name equivalent? No, because it doesn't have a name. They're not in the types. Is it structurally equivalent? Yes. Yes. Are they internal name equivalent? No, they're Q and R. Oh. Right, defined on different lines. So they have different internal names. Awesome. Okay, this one, this guy. Okay. Q is an array of I's. So if you take Q and you do the array access operator, what is that type does that return? I. Take I. Okay, great. Then S is of type takes in an I and returns an int. So S takes in a type I. So it, so is that call valid? Yeah, so it returns what type? An int. And then here we have an array access of p, which is an array of i. And we have access with an integer. So what's that going to return? An i. Exactly. OK, and t is an i. So is it name equivalent? Yes. Yes, right? The types here are i and i. Right? It doesn't matter how we got to that type i, that it was through these array accesses or function calls, right? Um, it's, the only thing we care about is comparing the types. Okay, is it structure equivalent? Yes. Yes, the name equivalent, or internal name equivalent also. Good. Question on that? Wait, all right. All three. Yes. Should be all right. Yeah. Why, did you get more points than you should have? You should come you forward. <laughs> okay. All right. Consider the following code in C syntax. Um, is there an equivalent of paint to this thing? I have a whiteboard, but it's not going to record if I do it on the whiteboard. Um, let's use. We'll use PowerPoint. Okay. So let's first look what this question is asking us to do. So consider the following code in C syntax. Uh, generic x, we have program main. Um, it says draw the program stack at the first execution of location one. Label on the stack all function frames, and each side of each function frame label the parameters of the function, the value of those parameters, the function's local variables, and the values of those local variables. Uh, you don't need to follow precise C-decal calling convention. Assume static scoping and pass by value standards. Okay. Live PowerPoint slide making. Okay. So here we're starting off executing main. Uh, main has one parameter i. So what's the value of i first? What's the value of i when we first execute this? That yeah, doesn't matter, right? 10, 100, 300, 500, we don't know, right? So this is main. Uh, we have variable i. Sorry, this is going to be really ugly because I didn't really think this through. Eh, close enough. OK. i, it has some unknown value. 
so that's the parameter to main. Main has a local func uh, local variable baz, which has the value, and then it has a care pointer c, which has the values one, zero, one, and two. Right. So all of this is main. Yeah. Okay. So that's all main. Okay. First thing that happens, if x is equal equal to 10, x is this global x, x starts off equal to 10. Funny that. Uh, then it sets i to be 20, i is 20, and then it sets x to be 0, so now x is 0, and then it prints out, is that relevant? No, it's not relevant. Okay, prints out i and x. Okay, next thing. If i is greater than 0, is i greater than 0? Yes, it has the value 20. Just calculate that. Then call bar and pass in c2, 0, and 1. So let's look at the function bar. It has uh, the parameter a, parameter b, parameter c. And so a has c2, c0, 1, 2, which is 2. c0 is 0. And c, uh, c is i, which is 20. Okay. Okay. And we have a local x and a local y. And then the first thing we do is set x equal to c plus 1. Okay. Now, important things. This function call, what happens first? Foo, right? We're calling the function foo, and we're passing that result to bar. So we have to go create a function frame for foo. And what are we passing in here? So in function foo, we have alpha as a parameter. We have beta. And then alpha is c, which we know is 20. And beta is b, which we know is 0. And then internally, it has its own internal a. First thing foo does is set a to 10. And then it sets x is equal to x minus 20. x was 0, now it's negative 20. And then what are we returning? The result of calling main x, right? So we really we need to create another function frame for main, which has a parameter i, which has the value x. What's the value of x? Minus 20. So we go back to main. We say minus 20. It has a, we have a new baz, which doesn't have a value. We have a new character c, character array c, 0, 1, 2. And then we say, is x equal to 10? Nope, it's negative 20. Is i greater than 0? Nope, i is negative 20. And then so we go into location 1, and we stop, and this is our stack here. So we have main bar foo main. Questions on that? All right. Last problem, the fun problem. Oh, we got five minutes. Okay. Well, I'll show you the answers first, and then we can talk about what they are. Okay. So here's a function, similar-ish, but different. Or no, that is similar. Okay. Uh, use static scoping, and basically you're asked if it's passed by value, what's the output? If it's passed by reference, if it's passed by name, what's the output? So if it's passed by value, this is the output. 0, 42, which happens here in the function foo. Uh, a is output. The value of A is uh, 0 from right here. Uh, star B is 42. Uh, the next thing that's output is C, 0, 1, and 2. Remember, this is passed by value, so they don't change. 0, 1, 2. And then we print out 10 and 20 here. Uh, 10 is from here, and 20 is from here. So why didn't this Y change? Yeah, it's passed by value, right? So what? So we malloc a new memory address, and we copy that memory address, and we put it in the value for y on this assignment statement, right? 
So this is exactly what we've been talking about for assignment semantics for pointers, right? So I have a box, the circle in there is the result of this malloc call. Then we set star y, which is what y points to, we're going to set that to be 20. Then we call foo. So what happens with b here in foo? Pass by value. Yeah. So we create a new, so it's passed by value, right? So B gets its own box with a circle, and we copy the value that's in Y to the value in D. So B, now the value in it is that address of that thing we just malloc, right? So when we say B is equal to malloc new size of an integer, right? Malloc creates a new box for us, and it takes that address and puts it in the value of B. So now B points has a memory address, it points to this new malloc memory location. But did that change why? No, because they're completely different, right? The values are different. And now when we change star b, right, we're changing this new b from this new memory we malloc. And then this doesn't change anything on fast by value. This is why we get this output. Yeah? Suppose uh, that malloc statement wasn't there. Mm -hmm. and you, in the function, you just put star b is equal would that change? Yes. So it's still, so that's the thing, right? Pass by value is you can't change what you pass in, right? So the whole point is you can, so in pass by value, you can never change what y, the value that's inside y. Now, because what you're copying in is an address with the star operator, you can change what y points to, but you can't change y itself in pass by value. So yeah, this hopefully, I don't know, pointers are no, they're not special, right? They're not any different than any other data type. You've learned everything you need to be able to, to do this, right? So we've done pass by value, we've done uh, malloc, we've done box circle diagrams, all that stuff. Okay, if you pass by reference, uh, the thing that changes is the last thing, changes to 0, 42, because in this case, I believe it's x is changing. And pass by reference. And then if you pass by name, now when you pass by name, it's the same as pass by reference, except that foo, this array C changes based on this here in R. Right? So because this expression is CI and this I is changing inside bar, that means that this array is going to change. So it becomes 0 042, 0 11, 0 042. Any questions on the midterm? Got about a minute. No? All right. Thanks, everyone. See you on Monday.